Hello and welcome to the Northeast Ohio Media Group Candidate Debates. I'm Bruce Geiselman. Today we're hosting a debate for the Fairview Park School Board. Five candidates are running for three openings on the school board this November. They are incumbents Katie Davis, Joe Shikoski, and Debbie Tidwell, along with challengers Kelly DeBay-Gillis and uh, Rabin Allen. Now, the incumbents were invited, but um, are, are not participating this evening. However, we will be speaking with DeBay Gillis and Allen. Uh, we're going to start with uh, one minute for each candidate to introduce themselves and explain why they're running. Then we'll ask questions, giving each candidate 90 seconds to answer and one minute for any follow-up. At the end, we will allow for 10 minutes for the candidates to ask each other questions with 60 seconds permitted for the answers. So why don't we start with uh, Mrs. DeBay-Gillis. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us why you're running. All right. Well, as you said, Bruce, I'm Kelly DeBay-Gillis. I am a 10-year Fairview Park resident, and I am the mom of two children who currently attend Gillis Suite Elementary. And I'm proud to say that my kids go to Fairview Park City Schools. I think that um, they're getting a great education. We're doing amazing things under the leadership of Superintendent Wagner. And I am confident that they are going to be great thinkers, doers, makers as a result of the education they're getting. Unfortunately, what I'm not confident in right now is our current Board of Education. Um, I feel that you know, they have not demonstrated the leadership that our district needs. And I believe that other Fairview Park residents feel the same way as a result of our board's track record. We need dynamic new leadership in Fairview Park, and we're only going to get that if we have new leaders. And I think with my 20 years of experience as an environmental scientist, as a, a policy analyst, and as a public outreach specialist, I've demonstrated that I know how to problem solve on collaborative teams, and that I know how to identify problems and solve them before they become costly controversies. And I'm looking forward to earning the votes of Fairview Park residents this, this fall. Okay. And Mr. Allen, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us why you're running? Sure. First off, Bruce, I'd like to thank you and the Northeast Ohio Media Group for hosting this event. It's an event I prioritized in my calendar, and I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm a seven-year resident of Fairview Park. My wife, Shannon, and I have a son, Aiden, who's eight years old, and they attend Gillis Sweet uh, Elementary. Um, and as a pediatric nurse of 15 years, I have really committed myself to healing and the well-being of children and families as well as the communities surrounding the Cleveland area. Um, with I received my Bachelor's of Science um, in Kent State University and I received my Master's of Science in Nursing at St. Xavier University in Chicago. I, through a team approach, I am currently the supervisor for the Center for Comprehensive Care at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. Um, I would like to improve our family school community partnership. I would like to advocate for the co-design of our strategic planning. And I would like to, and this is probably the nurse in me, I would like to care and support and provide for our district staff. Okay. Well, let's get started with the questions then. Um, now, the Fairview Park School Board um, uh, signed a three-year contract, I, I guess, um, I think I had the wrong year, I think it was in 2014 with uh, Jeffrey Andrews, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, discovered that um, he, uh, they rescinded the offer after learning that he had been placed on leave from a job in China. What, um, they ended up settling a contract dispute with them for $150,000. What lessons do you think were learned from that, or what lessons should the district have learned from that experience? Bruce, I'm so glad you brought that up, and that's a great question, one that I was hoping that we'd be able to discuss with the incumbents tonight, and unfortunately we'll be able to talk about it amongst ourselves. Um, I think the lessons learned, number one, it, you know, this is the, the primary job of the Board of Education is to hire the leader of our district, and you need to do your due diligence. And that means when you schedule seven interviews with seven candidates, you interview all candidates to determine the best one. I think the other thing is we learned through the public records request in this situation that some, unfortunately, of our board members were 
not listening to the concerns of other board members. And had they done that, had they listened to concerns, we most likely wouldn't have been in the position that we're in now. So I think it really shows a need for listening, for being um, thoughtful in making decisions. And you know, it's not all about one member's perspective. It's about listening to the concerns and having um, all members have their voice represented in decision making. All right, Mr. Allen. I like this question too. I, I mean, as a hiring manager at my place of employment, I am required to do my due diligence and I rely on the constituents within my organization to do their homework as well and make sure that when we have the top candidates, that's in fact they are top, they are qualified, and everything that's listed on their line items on their resume as well as their cover letters are validated with homework and make sure that they're in place. Um, I was very disappointed to find out when that did not get followed through, and it was a very costly uh, decision made by the district. In fact, in, uh, in order to back out of this decision, there was several hundred thousands of dollars that had to be paid. And just to put that into perspective, um, when we're looking at over roughly 200,000 plus dollars that the district had to absorb, if you look at our special education budget, for example, the federal financial input to the district is about $438,000. So they spent roughly 50% of what the federal allotment is for special education in our district. So we had to try and find out where is our district going to absorb that. Okay. And at this point, we would, if anyone has a, a, wants to respond with a 60-second comment, they can. I mean, you both seem to be kind of be on the same page, so I don't know. If but I, if you don't mind me jumping sure. in, I think one of the things that really surprised and disappointed me is that we don't have any accountability mechanisms in place. If you look at our current board policies, it's Chapter 1.20 of our district's policies, that it basically lays out the evaluation procedures for school board operations. The board is responsible for evaluating the board. Where's the accountability in that? And I think that policy needs to be reevaluated, updated, and we need to have accountability measures put in place for our Board of Education. They sit at the top of the organizational chart for our district. We hold our administrators accountable. We hold our teachers accountable. We hold our students accountable. Our board needs to have mechanisms in place for accountability so this never happens again. And then when people are screaming for a resignation, they've got some mechanism in place for recourse. Okay. Yeah, if I could add one more thing. Sure. Um, like, like Kelly had said, it, the, being at the top of the organization, uh, in addition to having a lot of responsibility, you have to be able to communicate effectively as well. When you make a bad decision, you have to not only hold yourself accountable to it, but you have to communicate what happened and why. It's the least you could do for the community. Okay. Well, the second question, the school district uh, in March approved the sale of the former Coffinberry School property to a housing developer uh, without requiring that a specific amount of green space be set aside for the public. Now, the developer has offered one parcel of land, but some Coffinberry residents said that, I guess it was 10 years ago, school officials and, and city officials indicated that three parcels of green space would be set aside. Uh, if the land were sold. And I'm going to ask what your position is on this and should the school board have guaranteed more green space. But first, I do want to point out that, uh, Kelly, you are active in the uh, Coffinberry Collaborative, which is um, an organization that, that has been addressing this issue. I wouldn't call us an organization. I would call us a group of concerned residents. But organization is a little too formal, I would say. But yes, you are correct. OK. Uh, so what, uh, what is your position on this, and, and should the school board have guaranteed more green space? Well, um, having just dis fully disclosed that I live fairly um, close proximity to the school property, it has been an issue that has consumed a lot of time and I've been very passionate about. Um, I believe that the, the failure of leadership happened in 2005, unfortunately, when we did not have adequate documentation. Um, there were lots of verbal agreements, and unfortunately, those verbal agreements eroded over time. But regardless of anybody's position on green space, I think it's important to understand it's the way in which the Board of Education conducted the property sale that many residents have an issue with. 
Um, it was sold for a sale, a sale price of $435,000. The Board of Education did not adequately advertise it for the required 30 days and, and put it out for public notice. They public noticed it in the Westlife, which is a small circulating newspaper. Um, it, they did not bother to, to advertise in the Plain Dealer. There was no for sale sign on the property. The Board of Education has a fiduciary responsibility to our district to make sure that that sale of property garnered as much money as possible. And I believe that they, had they been more open and transparent about the property being available for sale, we could have gotten significantly more money for that property and possibly had you know, enough money to not worry about maybe carving out a portion of it for, the, dist or for you know, the kids to play on. But regardless of the green space issue, the sale was not handled properly by the Board of Education, and that is a concern. Okay. Mr. Allen? One of the things that I always been learning more about the functions of a school board, um, one of the things I'm really really intrigued about is that the the communication piece of this and also their responsibility that there may be times that they have to make difficult decisions that may not necessarily align with all parties involved and that's where the communication really becomes key if the sale of the property if that was the only way you could sell that property I guess I could understand, I wouldn't agree with it, but I can understand that that may be the only way that they could have done so. They do have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that they receive the absolute most in value that is owed to the community and to the students so that we can work on program development. Now, there was a agreement that we had talked about with the 2005 master plan that allocated and there was talk about green space. Now, if there's already talk about that, then you should do your due diligence, you should do your homework, as you should do with the superintendent look, to make sure that all parties involved have an opportunity to step up and talk and share their, share their views on it, as well as look and say, hey, you had this master plan that allocated green space, maybe we should do something with that and honor our students. Now, the school board doesn't have responsibilities just within the walls of the school. The community is interconnected with the school, so we have a responsibility outside the walls of those schools as well. Okay. Can I follow up to yes. Raven's comments? Mm -hmm. And I, he brought up two really excellent points, and I'm completely in agreement with him. And I think communication is a really key factor that was missing in that whole controversy. They had used a series of executive sessions to make decisions about the sale. And while executive sessions for the sale of property are allowed under Ohio Sunshine Laws, they didn't meet the full intent of the law, and that was executive sessions for the sale of property are allowed if the discussion in public would have given a competitive advantage. And we know for a fact that there was no competitive advantage to be had because the appraisal report of the property was given to at least one of the developers the morning of the sale. So it kind of made everything moot about you know them wanting to um, be confidential about the appraisal. So it really should have been done in daylight. And that's one of the things that really is important to me as a Board of Education member, if I were to be elected, is making sure that executive sessions are used only when absolutely necessary for the most sensitive of issues. Open government is the best form of government. Okay. Did you have follow-up or should we move on to the next question? No, I think that covered it. Okay. <laughs> All right, very good. Um, now the school district is talking about putting together a master facilities plan um, I guess by next May, uh, that would determine current and future building needs. Now, do you think that the district is in need of replacing or renovating school buildings? Where would you start, and how do you feel about their hiring a company? I guess we don't have a price for this yet, but how do you feel about their hiring a company to put together this master facilities plan? And let's start with, oh, and I'm sorry, we should be alternating, start so let's with start Raven. with Yeah, Raven. he gets two in a row. <laughs> That's okay, no problem. Um, with regards to the point on hiring an outside consultant, if you can call them that, I, I think that's a good idea um, because it helps with trying to get more of the non-biased approach on looking at our district from more objective means. So it gives, it kind of takes the, the competition out of the, the array, for, if you could say that. Um, the other piece with the district, uh, the strategic planning piece that we're talking about is I think it's important to have a lot of the community involvement. Um, we recently had the community survey that was sent out. Well, I, I'm glad that it was well attended. There was, from what we were informed, there were 1,200 people that participated. And at the end of the survey, there were, I believe, 500 people that actually completed the survey from beginning to end. Um, I know there's the ability to analyze that from several angles, and it's a very good sampling of our population. But you also have to understand that 
uh, putting it in the context of roughly 500 people that finished that survey, we have almost 12,000 registered voters uh, in Fairview Park. So when you're looking at those two, you really want to make sure that you have community involvement when you have a strategic plan, especially of this magnitude. When we're talking about the facilities, I know we recently had the Ohio School Construction Facility Commission come in to do their 23-point inspection on our facilities. Um, I've heard anecdotally from a lot of families about the good and bad from our, um, both our Mayor Middle School and our high school, as well as from our Parkview Early Education. Um, do we renovate or do we get new buildings? I, I think it really needs to have a conversation that has a community at the table to help decide that. Okay, Mrs. debate Ellis. Um, I think that it's great that we are having all of this community involvement and that we're doing all of these plannings. As Raven said, community involvement is important and we do need to expand the number of folks that are participating because it's their tax dollars that will fund this, this facility upgrade. I think there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind though, and we have to really understand what is the borrowing capacity of our district in order to make these renovations happen. I know that there are some concerns about you know, a new building versus a renovated building. The fact is, from what I understand from our treasurer, we really only have bond capacity right now at about 7.5 million. And we've had, um, under our previous superintendent, um, an assessment done of our facilities. I believe it was in uh, 2000, 12 and 13, and they came in with two different cost ranges, but it was about between five and nine million to renovate Mayor Middle School and the high school. So we really, I think, are looking at probably adaptive reuse of our building, not mm -hmm. necessarily, we probably don't have the resources right now to do a whole new building, which that's fine, but I think we have to make sure that we keep all these decisions about our facilities as local as possible, and that means you know, not necessarily engaging with the state um, to take any of their grant funds because then we become beholden to the Ohio Design Manual. I think local decisions about the facilities are the best way to go, but we have to be able to prioritize the renovations that we need, and hopefully we can do that with community input. I'm excited to see what the community will say about our facilities. Okay. Any follow-up, or should we move on? Just one quick follow-up. Sure. Um, when we're looking at whether we redesign if the decision is made or if the decision is made to build new, I think it's really important to look at who we're going to serve. Um, we have a changing demographic in Fairview, and just in my neighborhood alone, I've seen several new families with younger children come in. Um, I know from, from uh, observance, we have five full-day kindergartens. We have three half-day kindergartners, uh, each with 20 students plus each class. Um, and I know Gillis Suite, we've kind of already outgrown a little bit because we had to move the sixth grade over to the uh, middle school area which makes the middle school, high school now representative of seven grades. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at how we're going to better utilize our facilities, we have to take into account the changing demographic and then we have to look at our long-term vision and try and see what are we gonna look at in five years? Are we gonna have more younger children, older children? How can we better serve our demographic? Okay. Well, uh, Superintendent, uh, and, and I guess we'll start with you again, Raven, since uh, <laughs> yes. All is fair. <laughs> yeah. um, Superintendent Bill Wagner has discussed the possibility of seeking a bond issue, um, which would be a tax increase in November 2016, to pay for whatever improvements end up being recommended. Would you favor putting a bond issue on the ballot for this purpose? Well, I think there needs to be more discussion on putting that bond issue up. We have to understand, and we talked about fiduciary responsibility. Um, we have to get a better understanding when we're looking at bond issues. What exactly is the bond issue going to go for and how are we going to allocate it? So I'd like to know a lot more information on that bond issue because even if, and I'm definitely, I'm here, I'm pro-education, um, so I always want what's best for our children and I feel it is an investment to make sure that our future generations are cared for better than how we were cared for. Um, but I also don't want to frivolously spend either. I want to make sure that we do it strategically and it is with a good purpose. Okay. Kelly? Well, I think it's also important to keep in mind that we do have a reserve in Fairview Park. Um, we've been very, very, very um, blessed with great fiscal management. Um, you know, left with the previous uh, treasurer that we had, Ryan Gazzoni, and then our current treasurer, Amy Hendricks. So we've been able to create a nest egg in our district. And I know during the community survey meetings, there have been people who have expressed an interest instead of you know, going for an increase in taxes or another bond, 
why don't we consider dipping into that reserve that we have accumulated in the district? So I think we need to get the facilities report from the OFCC and look and see what sort of renovations they recommend and the price tag associated with that. AVG, their scope of work um, includes validating the OFCC's renovation of uh, price tag and making sure it's been ground truth and it's appropriate. I know they just did that for the Polaris Center and they're going to that's the approach they're going to take for us. Mm. And then once we are able to kind of say, okay, we've cal recalibrated this renovation or upgrade um, assessment, we'll be able to know better what the priorities are and we can decide if if a bond is necessary or if we can use the funds that we've accumulated that, you know, have come from good stewardship of our resources to date. So I think, again, like Raven said, it's a conversation we still need to have, but I, we need to, to look at what our, our um, monetary capabilities are and compare those with the priorities of what we want to see happen in our facilities. Okay. Any follow-ups? Okay. Um, and I guess we're back to Kelly now. Common Core requirements and assessments are controversial <laughs> with uh, a lot of parents who object to teaching to the test and what some feel is excessive testing, and others support the standardization of education. What are your thoughts on Common Core? Well, I think we have to be careful. Common Core and our standardized tests are two different things. Common Core sets out the standards for our curriculum. It tells us what we need to be able to teach in the classroom, and then it's up to our teachers and our curriculum experts in the district to determine how that's going to be applied. Common Core, while there is much controversy over it, I believe that it, it gives our teachers a roadmap to be able to say, these are the things that milestones I need to hit, but I'm going to have the freedom in my classroom to apply Common Core standards through project-based learning. And we're seeing that happen in Fairview Park. I know my daughter's second grade teacher is amazing at doing that, and so many of our other Fairview Park teachers are. And then there's the issue of standardized testing, which gives my kids heartburn, me heartburn, probably everyone in the district heartburn. And I believe that while it is one potential indicator of the success of our children, the success of our teachers, it is not the, the be all end all and it shouldn't be. We talk, I'm, I work in, in the environmental arena and we talk about the health of water and that we need many different tests to be able to say how clean our water is. If we took one test, we would never know, you know if it's mm -hmm. truly clean. And that's the way it is with our kids. One test isn't gonna tell us everything we need to know about the performance of our teachers and what our kids are learning. So, you know, I think that we have to have it in the mix, but it should not be the only way that we assess academic performance and the performance of our teachers. And I hope as a district, we find other ways besides standardized testing to do so. Okay, Mr. Hill. When we're talking about Common Core, I, I, I really struggle with, with, with the Common Core. I, I like the example of it providing a roadmap, especially for the low performing schools, to have a platform to where they can raise their standards. Uh, and, and really provide a better education for the students in those districts. Uh, I believe our students are doing very well and I'm concerned that sometimes you may have a top-down approach where you have the higher performing schools now being pulled down as a result of some of these standards. Um, and I also cha am challenged because I understand it's more of a top-down approach. I really like to see more, and this is what Kelly talked about, more of the locally driven um, projects that are given to really augment what the children are doing uh, within our community so that they can get a better well-rounded education. Standardized testing and and I definitely get the heartburn <laughs> phenomenon as well um, especially when you know they're timed and the clock's ticking and, and all of a sudden you, you blank out because you can't articulate an intro um, but it really works um, well but there's one thing that's missing is because it's one variable in a very large picture. Now I work in healthcare. So if I approach a patient with an illness and I look at one thing and say, that's what you have, I'm gonna miss the big picture. And we're gonna lose an opportunity to really graduate high performing, socially responsible, creative, compassionate uh, students that have a competitive edge in the region. Okay. Any follow up? No, good okay. answer. <laughs> the, um, the Fairview Park uh, School District's performance on the state's 2014 report card slipped a little bit, but school officials said that's because the state raised performance standards this year. The district met 20 of 24 standards for 2014. It had met all 24 standards in 2013. Do you have any ideas for improving academic performance? And, and I think we're starting with you this sure. time. Sure. Um, well, it's my understanding that when we're looking at current and previous reporting entities, they're a little bit different in measure. Mm -hmm. So trying to say that we slipped a little is a little bit different because you're not really measuring the same tool. 
So that's one of the glitches that you can say that if we slipped a little, well, I don't know. And, and quite frankly, I feel our current report card is not a true reflection of our performance in the district. We have a lot of really great educators that are doing a lot of really great work. Um, when we're looking at the report card, and as far as slipping a little, uh, I think there's some room that we could always grow. Um, but I think we have to look at, again, we're looking at a report card, one measure, although it's multivariable, there's a lot of things that we need to look at and see because I think we're doing a lot better than what that report card is showing. Okay. And I'm going to kind of use your, your comment as a, a platform, a jumping point. Um, this idea of we are doing great things in Fairview Park, I, I have been able to talk with some of the strategic planning action group members. And one of the things that they've really talked about is the need for the district to be more celebratory about our successes. Fairview Park isn't a toot your horn kind of community, and I don't think as a school district, I agree with my friends on the action group that we have not been very vocal about celebrating our successes. And it doesn't always have to be driven by what the state is measuring. There are plenty of things that we are really excelling in that we need to be able to celebrate and communicate to Fairview Park residents as well as the region for other folks who are interested in relocating into our community. Our schools should be a magnet for new businesses, for new residents. And I believe that Superintendent Wagner's plan is to develop a communications and marketing plan that's going to allow us to be in control of the, the messaging of how we celebrate the successes and the things that we're doing well in Fairview Park. I don't believe that we should just rely on the scores that the state gives us. There are so many other things that we could be talking about as a school district to say that we're excelling. And I hope we do that. Yeah. Well, now we're to the point where the candidates can ask questions of each other. You could each ask one question of the other candidate if you so desire. Raven, ask away. <laughs> All right. Well, here's, let's see, where's my question at here? Make it a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so research suggests that family, school, and community engagement in education is interconnected and a top predictor of school preparedness and academic success. Tell me your vision on improving that connectedness and how you would report out the success of those efforts. I think that's a really great question. I think it's very important because the schools are really the heart of the community and we need to see the community members, city council and schools working sustainably and in, I want to say tandem, but there's three units, but as a tricycle or a stool to be able to um, achieve really great things. I think that the more parents that we're able to get into the school building, the stronger our schools are. I was actually having a conversation today with one of our secretaries about how you can tell like certain families who are in there all the time, their kids are more engaged. There are a lot of families in Fairview Park that don't have that luxury. We need to find ways to be able to engage those families and bring them into the fold. And whether that's you know through mentorship programs or outreach programs that maybe can be part of the marketing. You know, I feel that there are so many families whose faces you recognize and sometimes you don't and we need to get them more engaged. Engagement also, the schools in the community. I know on the Coffinberry issue, I was really disappointed when controversy came up, this idea of the Board of Education not showing up to our town hall meetings. I think it speaks to leadership when folks, there's a, a controversy or a crisis happening in the community and people want to engage in a discussion and folks aren't showing up. They're sending letters instead and letting other people speak on their behalf. So I, I think people who are willing to show up to conversations, willing to show up to town halls, those are the types of leaders that our community needs and our schools are going to be the better for it. So thanks for your question, Raven. <laughs> okay. And did you have a question for Raven? Yeah, sure. So you and I both agree in accountability and the need for accountability. Um, and I think that we've seen our current board not be as accountable as possible. What ideas do you have uh, for our Board of Education to make sure that accountability is put into place moving forward? What, what would you recommend we do? Well, one idea that I pull from my workplace and as a supervisor of a group of people um, it's my job to evaluate their performance, but I also developed a mechanism and gave them an opportunity to evaluate my performance. And I gave them an opportunity to do it in an anonymous way. That's awesome. Especially so you don't have that fear of retribution. And quite frankly, if you have one of the school board members walking through the hallway and you go up to a teacher and say, so how am I doing? <laughs> It really is an awkward moment, um, and for I would like to say it's an honest answer, but there's always that, that concerning moment. 
Um, so when we're looking at um, accountability, I would like to see more evaluative tools, uh, especially with metrics that are embedded in our strategic planning. So if we have various parts of the strategic plan, and the board also, and I had said this at the, I attended the Parents of Special Education group, and essentially my acronym of what is the function of the school board, the best way I could describe it is we help steer the ship. So when you're looking at long-term vision, you need to make sure that you have somebody that knows how to steer the ship, but if not, you have a mechanism that's going to uh, illustrate that as well. Um, and I think tools of evaluating would be helpful. I agree. Okay, well, thank you. And, and um, I want to thank uh, Kelly DeBay Gillis and uh, Raven Allen for participating in our debate today. Uh, that's about all that we have time for. Uh, please check back to cleveland.com uh, to read about the debates, uh, issues, and candidates for the upcoming election. Early voting starts October 6th. And thank you for joining us.